morning and welcome to the Pastor's Corner. I'm your host, Pastor Dr. Wayne Baker, bringing you the Pastor's Corner. We believe to be the inspired Word of God. Well, today we will continue where we left off last week. By the way, I want to thank everyone who came to our church last Sunday. I want to take, thank the kids. I want to thank the kids for their participation in the program. I want to thank you for enjoying the delicacies that we had, <laughs> although they were hamburgers and hot dogs and a few other delicacies, but you enjoyed yourself. That's the main thing. You had a lot of fun at Spirit Field. Now last Sunday we were on praise and we want to invite you back again uh, this Sunday. Don't just let it be a uh, year of fair Easter, uh, Mother's Day, uh, how is it? Uh, some <laughs> uh, Mother's Day and Easter and Christmas, yeah, CMEs. Christmas, Mother's Day <laughs> and Easter. Uh, forgive me for that. But uh, yeah, we had a great time last week. Now, I want to invite you back again this week. But let's have a word of prayer and then we'll start our message today. Father, I thank you for your uh, message today and I ask that you anoint uh, me that I may speak forth your word and do it boldly. In Jesus' name, amen. Now last week we pointed out, we're, we're studying now the 15th chapter of 1 Corinthians. We'll start with verse 8. And last of all, he was seen of me also as one born out, born out of due time. Let me give you the context, context of this. Paul said after that he was seen of above 500. He said in verse 5 that he was seen of Peter. Then up to 12, that's 1, 2, and then 500 in verse 6. After that he was seen of James. That's another testimony. And last of all, he was seen of me also as one born out of due time. Paul was the hardest one of the disciples. He was the last one to accept the fact that Jesus Christ died. You see, he was a staunch Jew. He was probably the most educated Jew of his time. And he studied under the great Dr. Gamaliel, Gamaliel, if you will. And he was brought up at, at, at his side. So he persecuted the Christians, he killed them, and he beat them until he was changed. You see, when you meet Jesus, you cannot stay the same. Paul was converted, someone said, between the horse's bridle and the ground. He was, and once he was converted, he was not like some of us. Paul was on fire. He did not care whether he lived or whether he died. And he said in verse 9, I am the last and the least of the apostles that am not fit. That's what the word meet means. I am not fit to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. So what if you did, Paul? God has something that he calls grace. In other words, the more he persecuted, the more grace he received. But Paul gave his own testimony. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. Let me tell you, I can identify Paul. By the grace of God, I am what I am. I was a little country boy in Crawford, Alabama, where I came from. Not knowing Jesus, Jesus arrested me when I was uh, in Cleveland, Ohio. My best friend had died. And I tell this everywhere I go. I was contemplating really uh, getting out of this world somehow or somewhere or another. I deemed life as not worth living. But Jesus knew that, see, and he, uh, he arrested me. And then a few months later, I was called into ministry. I was way back in 1975. I've been on the battlefield ever since. God gave me grace. You heard the song that Sam Cooke sang, Jesus gave me water. 
and the water that he gave me, Sam Cooke said, was not from the well. This is my life. This was Paul's life, and this could be your life. You need everlasting living water that you cannot get from a water fountain or a bottle. You need life-giving water that only Jesus can and will give. The Bible said, he that believe on Jesus, out of his belly will flow rivers of living water. Water comes from your innermost being. Paul said, I am the least of the apostles, that I should receive this grace. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. In other words, I was so messed up that only God could correct me. Only a living God could make me what I am. But look at Paul now. He is boldly declaring the resurrection of Jesus. Look at Paul back when he was a Pharisee. He was under the tutelage of Dr. Gamaliel, and he was under Phariseeism. He went down to bind people who believed in Christ and kill them. That's what Paul wanted them. He wanted them out of the way. He wanted them out of the world. But God, but God, but not uh, for God's grace. God shed his grace on the Apostle Paul. And so Paul said, by the grace of God, I am what I am. In other words, man did not make me this way. I got this way by the grace of God, which was bestowed upon me was not in vain. In other words, God did not select me to produce vanity. It was not in vain. Paul said, but I labored more of abundantly than they all. He labored more than James. He labored more than Peter. He labored more than Matthew, Matthias, all of those people. Paul labored more. He received more whippings. In 2 Corinthians 11, 12th chapter, if you desire to read it, than they all. He, his testimony was great, greater than all of them uh, together because Paul boldly he preached the gospel of faith and I want to be like Paul I want to boldly I want to get out of here with a bang out of this world I don't know how much time I have left but I want to boldly preach God's word and Paul did that therefore whether it were I or they so we preach and so you believe. Now if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? Now people are like then, were like then, the way they are now. They are refuting the resurrection. There are some people, atheists, who can't stand to be around Christian people. There are some people who are agnostic, who cannot stand uh, the truth of God's word. But Jesus said, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. People, we need the truth today with the invasion of Ukraine by the Russians. We need the truth when you see these tornadoes, you see these hurricanes, you see these mudslides, you see women aborting their babies. I'm, I've never seen women stand up for abortion like I'm seeing now. You're killing your babies. That's what Pharaoh did to our people back in Egypt. He killed them. Uh, he told the uh, midwives, he said, if it be a female, I want you to save her. See, female, they can give sexual favors and also fe females are not likely to fight back as males are. A male will fight you tooth and nail. So he wanted to kill them and throw them in the river. He said throw, just throw them in the river but the midwives would 
not do that because they obeyed God. People today, Israelites, uh, we are still sinning against God. God has punished our people enough. We are under a covenant of death now. All because back in Deuteronomy 28th chapter, if you don't believe me, read it. It's talking about black Negro people who did not keep their covenant with God. And so if we don't keep our covenant now, and we are of the world, we are killing our babies and doing all. Homosexuality is another thing that grips the, the uh, African people uh, on this continent. Uh, it grips Negro people. And we, we are some of the sin, most sinful people on this planet, people. Things that are happening uh, to us is not uh, a coincidence. We have earned the right to be uh, treated poorly. But God has our backs, you see. God said he would resell us according to our old estates in Israel. So the day is coming when we are going back uh, to Israel. But now we've got to endure this because of the sin of our father. Paul starts his proof in verse 13. But if there be no resurrection of the dead, then is Christ not risen. You see, if there is no resurrection of the dead, uh, Christ is not risen. So today is very important. Uh, last Sunday, matter of fact, the resurrection is very important uh, for the dead to rise because the Bible specifically says that if there is no resurrection of the dead, then is Christ not risen. Josh McDowell has a book out. Uh, he calls uh, Proofs of the Resurrection. It's a, actually, the name of it is a Things That Demand a, a Verdict That Happen. And he mentioned that Christ is either Lord, a liar, or a lunatic. I got the name of it. Evidence that demands a verdict. In other words, this thing was not done in a corner. So Josh McDowell got a book out called uh, Evidence That Demands a Verdict. There's no way you can read that book without coming to the verdict that the resurrection was necessary. And if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching vain and your faith is all so vain. So what am I telling these young people who uh, experienced their mother dying? And they ask me, it's pastor. They say, is there a God up there? I say, yes, it is. How do we know? I tell them that Jesus rose from the dead and he loved you. And he wants to be in your life. And if Christ be not risen, you see, I'm lying. That would make me a liar. And the Bible says in verse 15, yea, and we are found false witnesses. See, I'm witnessing every Sunday I preach and I believe from the word of God. But my preaching is in vain if Christ did not rise from the dead. Yeah, we have found false witnesses of God because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he raised not up, if so be that the dead rise not. See, it's very important that uh, Christ rose from the dead. Because if he did not rise from the dead, then we have found false witnesses uh, for Christ. And if Christ, verse 17, be not raised, your faith is vain. Ye are yet in your sin. And the Lord says that. We are yet in our sin if Christ be not raised. Then they also which are fallen asleep in Christ are perished. That means those who have died. Uh, your loved ones, your mothers, your fathers, they have died, and you're not going to see them again. They didn't go to heaven. Uh, matter of fact, they probably went to hell uh, somewhere. <laughs> then they also which are fallen asleep, that's those who are dead, are perished. Perished means 
that they are no more, or either that they, they might be in hell. But if your mother, your father believed in Jesus Christ, uh, then they did not perish. Now here is the main thing in my life. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. I don't care how good America is. I don't care what's in the Western world. If in this life, Paul said, we have hope, and Paul was living a pretty good life because he was a Pharisee. Pharisees got the money out of that temple and what have you, and Paul was one of the big boys here. He was one of uh, the swingers. He was one of the movers and shakers uh, in Jerusalem at that time, so to speak. But Paul said, if in this life only, I don't, I don't care how long you live, it's a longer time dead. Uh, if you had all the clothes that you could uh, wear, all the clothes, the hard shaft of marks or some other uh, fine suit company could fit you with, and you didn't have Jesus, and if he did not rise from the dead, your living is in vain. Uh, somebody said, live while you're living, because you know what you said. No matter how long you live, it's a longer time dead. I said, brother said, do your thing. And a lot of people now are doing their thing. They are living wantonly. They are living uh, irrationally. Uh, it's nothing now for people to kill people. Someone walked in the school and killed so many small children. That's a sane, sick person. I would say that person needs Jesus and he needs him very badly. Verse 20, But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruit of them that slept. You see, the first fruits, uh, which means that everybody who had died, Jesus came from the dead. He was considered uh, God's first fruit. But every man, uh, matter of fact, it starts with this, verse 22, pardon me. For since by man came death, and you know that Adam sinned in the Garden of Eden, and death came to all men through Father Adam. You see, sin is transferred through your family. We got sin in our bloodline because our father sinned, and that means that we are sinners too. It's transferred through uh, the Father. So there's no way that we could have gotten around uh, sin. The Bible says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But thank God we didn't come short of His grace. But every man in his own order, see, God's going to call us in our own order. Christ the first fruits. Afterward, they that are Christ at his coming. Then cometh the end. What's going to happen in the end? We all will stand before the judgment seat of Christ, that the Christians, those who are saved. He's going to judge us according to our works. But there is a great white throne judgment in Revelation where everyone will be judged. Those who are judged according to their works will be cast into a lake of fire and burn forever and ever and ever. You don't want to be cast into that lake of fire. I know you don't. And now is the time to do something about it. Then cometh the end, when he shall deliver up the kingdom of God, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and his power. I tell you in Daniel, the second chapter, there was a great stone cut out without hand, and it smote the image on its feet, and it crushed all of these nations, all of the kingdoms. The great kingdoms that were yet in Daniel's day to come forth would be Babylon. Babylon was present at that time. It was Persia, uh, symbolized by the arms of silver, it was Greece symbolized by the breastplate of uh, bronze, and it was Rome 
symbolized by layers of iron and partially mixed with clay, and then the great uh, Holy Roman Empire. Those were all, and, and then America too. America would be smitten on its feet and crushed, and all the empires of that day were shattered because God has spoken that it would happen, you see. Mystery, Babylon the Great, will be crushed in the end. Why? Because God, verse 25, God must reign till he had put all enemies under his feet. I'm speaking of God, Christ, God. The last image that shall be destroyed is death. And people, I've done so many funerals. I've been to so many funerals. I, I hasten that that day would come about when little girls lose their mother, little boys lose their fathers. It's not a pretty sight to do a eulogy and uh, they don't quite understand what's going on. So the last enemy that will be conquered will be death. The last enemy, verse 26, says that shall be destroyed is death. Then we can gladly say, O oh death, where is thy sting? O oh grave, where is your victory? For he hath put all things under his feet. America too will be put under his feet. There'll be no more war. There might be no more slavery. There will be no more racism, no more oppression, uh, no more uh, dodging things that are coming upon the earth. No more tornadoes, no more hurricanes, no more mudslides, no more war, uh, no more oppression uh, by those higher than we are. Those things will be passed away. For he has put all things under his feet. How much are all things? All things mean all, 100% of it. But when he said all things are put under him, it is manifest that he is accepted which did put all things under him. Now who, who are we talking about is accepted? The Father. Everybody, everything will be under the Son except the Father. They're going to co-reign uh, together. They're going to rule this world together. As Trinitarians, we believe in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We believe that they are all one, you see. So the Father could not be subject to the Son yet. And they will co-reign on this earth when he has put all things under his feet. And people, I look forward to that day when all things are put under the feet of Jesus. Hebrews, the second chapter, has the same meaning and the same connotation. This is all for this week, people. The next week we'll take it up with verse 28. And when all things shall be subdued unto him, then shall the Son also himself be subject unto him that put all things under him, that God may be all in all. Let us pray. Father, I thank you today for those who uh, listen uh, to the Word, for those who are sick, for those in hospital nursing home. And Father, I especially pray for Sister Mamie. She's in uh, the nursing home. And she told me, Lord, that she didn't want to live any longer. But you know, Lord, how long you want to keep her on this earth regardless to how she feels. I thank you for her. And Lord, give her hope. And Lord, she will praise you from now until she leaves this world. She's a good Christian. And Lord, visit her. Give her hope, Lord. Give her faith. Strengthen her faith. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Now, those of you who have heard this message and you want to become a part of this church or some other church, maybe, all you got to do is say, Lord Jesus, come into my life. I believe that you are what Dr. Baker said you are. And come into my life. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen and amen. 
I'll see you again next week, uh, my people. And meanwhile, don't forget to pray. Until next week, so long. Hello, everyone. I want to introduce you to my new book, The Curse of Ham Revisited. Now, you can get this book on my website at drwaynebaker.com. It's a great book. Everyone should have it in their library. That's Dr. Wayne. Baker.com Spearfield is a church that is definitely family oriented and we believe in being together. When you're at Spearfield, you're at a place where you never ever feel alone. There's always someone either praying for you, checking on you, making sure you're good, and also spiritually feeding you. So we're thankful to have a pastor like Pastor Wayne D. Baker, who definitely teaches from the heart as well as from a place of education and higher learning. We're grateful to have that because he breaks down the word into a place in which you and I can understand and be able to add it to our practical lives every day, I'm telling you. So listen, if you now don't have a church home and you're looking for a place to settle and looking for a place to join and be a part of a family, please come see us at Spearfield Ministries, where it will be the end of your search for a friendly church. Spearfield Ministries, the end of your search for a friendly church. We are located at 3898 Mulberry Drive, which intersects with Morris Road in Columbus, Georgia. Services begin at 10 a.m. on Sunday and Wednesday night Bible study at 7 p.m. You may also watch our services on YouTube and follow us on our social media platforms, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Hashtag FF Ministries GA. You may also contact us by calling 706-562-0071 or via email at FF Ministries GA at gmail.com. We hope to see you there.